Welcome to episode 57 of the Clack Manager Women for Independence podcast. And this is our first show in 2021, so Happy New Year to all our listeners. How's it going so far? Uh, Not too well, I think we'll all agree. Although there are some highlights here and there which we will pick out as we go through. And we'll do our best to chase away the January blues. So it's 2021, and I don't think anybody was sorry to see the back of 2020. But here we go, we're still in level four lockdown, although the vaccine does give us some hope for the future. We've still got an ultra right wing government in Westminster, and now, though, we've also got Brexit. The fabled Brexit has actually happened. And already we are seeing pictures of empty shelves in supermarkets. I've seen some in Luton, in Belfast. We've also got fishermen who, as you all know, were the poster children of Brexit. And this sea of opportunity that was going to come their way when they got their waters back. Well, it's not quite working out exactly like that, is it? And whilst we can all look at them and go, why are you surprised you knew your market was in the EU? They managed to overlook that fact. Certainly the the ones who supported Brexit did. I recall that the West Coast shellfishermen in Scotland certainly were more clued up about what problems they were likely to face. And unfortunately, yes, they are facing them. Let's just remind ourselves of Dr. Philippa Whitford's very good explanation of what the problems were likely to be. And this is from 2018. One of the other industries in my constituency is fishing, which is always held up as the great beneficiary of Brexit. But in my constituency, the catch is dominated by langoustine and lobster, 85% of which goes to the EU. And every few hours of delay decreases its value. Now, the problem for them is that actually fishermen from Northern Ireland, much as they don't want the benefit, will be able to fish in the same waters and have direct and swift access to the single market through the south of Ireland. They also will not face tariffs on processed fish, which will hit smoked salmon, not just Scotland's biggest food export, but the UK's biggest food export. And we're talking about tariffs that range from 5 to 16%. We lose our advantage over Norwegian salmon. And yet, the real problem of the fishing industry, which is that the vast majority of quota is held tightly by very few companies will not be fixed by this. In Scotland, 80% of boats share 1% of quota. In England, 77% share 3% of quota, while a handful of firms own the majority. And an additional issue in England is that huge amounts of quota have been sold to Dutch and Spanish companies. That's not Europe doing that. That's not the common fisheries policy. It's because this place has never cared about fishing. Up until now, it was always expendable. But, oh, it's been a very useful ploy around Brexit. Now, if this was clear to Dr Philippa and all of us as far back as 2018, you'd think that the UK government's fisheries minister would be very, very clued up on things. As it happens, not so much. Nestor, I suppose my question is, did your jaw drop as well when you saw this uh, uh, agreement that had been delivered in fisheries, when really this is, was such an iconic subject? No, the agreement came when we were all very busy on Christmas Eve, in, in my case, organising the, the local nativity trail. We'd been waiting and waiting. It looked like it was coming for for probably four days before it actually arrived. I, for one, had gone through, as I'm sure members of this committee had, 
a gamut of emotions over those um, four days, as, as many of us have truthfully for the last four and a half years. I was, I'm, I'm a passionate believer in having a deal. I think the deal is a good one for the UK. In fisheries terms, it's true to say that we had, as an industry, dreamed some pretty, pretty big dreams, not least in the last four and a half years, but, but for much longer in some cases. And it's also true to say that we didn't get everything we asked for. Yes, that was the UK's fisheries minister. <coughs> And as soon as Westminster opened for business in January, our SNP MPs were queuing up to get the boot in. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Stay in the UK, they said in 2014. Leave the EU, they said in 2016. A sea of opportunity, they said in 2020. Bad advice backed by lies and disinformation all down the line. And Scotland's fishing industry is among those feeling the betrayal. Now Scots businesses can't get their product to their European markets, EU fishing fleets can still access our waters, and we're still subject to the CFP, but now don't have a say in how it runs. Scots businesses have lost many thousands of pounds, and communities are looking at job losses. DFDS can't take groupage loads until at least Monday because the government made a mess of the paperwork system. Businesses may close and people may lose jobs because this government messed up. Jimmy Buchan of the Scottish Seafood Association, once a Tory election candidate, said that ministers aren't doing enough. The sales director of John Ross told UK ministers that the Brexit deal was worthless unless ministers took action. It is not just teething issues, Minister. It is chaos and it is costing business shed loads of money. So who exactly do they apply to for compensation? Shall I give them the minister's mobile phone number? Remaining in Scotland with Drew Hendry. Drew Hendry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. We already know that if the period of disruption that we're witnessing is extended, then European consumers will seek alternative suppliers and will be unlikely to return to Scottish suppliers. When asked how long it would take to sort the problems, his ministerial colleague, the Honourable Member for Banff and Buchan, said on the radio this morning, how long is a piece of string? Does he think that's an acceptable answer to an industry facing what they describe is a catastrophe? Said to Scotland with Richard Thompson. Richard Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the lead up to the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, John Ross Jr. in Aberdeen said they had to endure the UK government issuing a barrage of useless information. DR Colin in Eyemouth has said Brexit has more or less finished the business. Prices at the quayside Peterhead fish market are now 80% below normal. All of this taken together with what was described in the front page of the fishing news as the Prime Minister's Brexit betrayal. Isn't it the case that rather than the promised sea of opportunity, through its incompetence, the UK government is now in danger of delivering instead a sea of insolvency for the Scottish seafood industry? Scotland with Joanna Cherry. Joanna Cherry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, Thanks to the United Kingdom government's incompetence, the fishing industry is in chaos, not just in Scotland, but across the United Kingdom. And many are facing bankruptcy. In a disastrous interview with Radio Scotland this morning, the Minister's junior colleague, the Honourable Member for Banff and Buchan, told us that everyone knew there would be challenges with Brexit. So can I ask the Minister, when will he be renaming the Sea of Opportunity as the Sea of Challenges? And Joanna Cherry was right there to make the point that fishermen all around the UK are up in arms and here's just a flavour of some of the other areas it's not just the Scottish fishermen. Joachim Bartlebury. Uh, one catch brought to shore by Port and Line fishing boats is scallops and fair play to AM- A&M Seafoods of Fleetwood they're still supporting Welsh fishermen by continuing to buy up scallops but at present these have to be frozen as there's simply no way to get them to continental markets fresh. I'm told that paperwork on both sides of the English Channel now means an extra cost per consignment of 5%. This looks like a tariff and it hurts like a tariff to an industry that was promised a tariff-free Brexit. Could the Minister tell me how he is working with Welsh Government to ensure the survival of Welsh inshore fishing? And will he admit that for these, our fishing communities, this bare-bones deal is a no-deal Brexit by the back door? That's a Merseyside with Bill Esterson. Bill Esterson. 
the shortage of vets to inspect fish, the lack of customs agents to process border forms, and there not being enough time for businesses to adapt to new rules of origin are, I would suggest, Mr Speaker, a lot more than teething problems. The Secretary of State might want to rethink his analysis there. But what the fishing communities up and down our country want to know is when is he going to fix the problems caused by the government's failure to prepare for the new border arrangements? And the issue of fishing was also raised in the following debate with Jacob Rees-Mogg responding to Tommy Shepherd's inquiry with probably the most ridiculous response, certainly in 2021 to date. Let's see how long he keeps that record. I think it could be quite a long time. The SNP spokesperson, Tommy Shepherd. Tommy Shepherd. Let me now turn to the Brexit fishing disaster. Boats confined to harbour, lorry loads of seafood destroyed, the industry losing one million a day as firms go bust, all as a result of Brexit red tape imposed by this government. Yet when asked about this yesterday, the Prime Minister refused to answer. And when asked this morning how long this would last, the government minister contemptuously replied, how long is a piece of string? When can we have a debate about compensation for the Scottish seafood industry for the havoc that has been wreaked upon it by this Conservative government? And with the select committee which oversees our relationship with the European Union being scrapped, what parliamentary mechanism will replace it? Um, The fishing issue was covered a moment ago by my right hon friend, the Secretary of State for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, uh, and perhaps the Honourable Gentleman should have tuned into that debate uh, rather than bringing it up at business questions. But what is happening is is that the government is tackling this issue, is dealing with it as quickly as possible, and the key is we've got our fish back. They're now British fish, and they're better and happier fish for it. I spotted an interesting question on Twitter, and somebody was asking... Why do we export so much of our shellfish when we have fishermen in Scotland who can't sell their shellfish? So a little bit of research. The main shellfish that we buy is prawns, king prawns, tiger prawns, and we buy the warm water farmed stuff which comes from India, Vietnam, Thailand, Indonesia, Madagascar mainly. Whereas Scottish shellfish exports are obviously cold water, they're langoustine, king scallop, razor clam, brown crab, blue lobster, mussels, oysters. Now, I've never tried razor clam, but I've certainly seen them available in supermarkets, um, also langoustine. And I do often get my fresh fish from the fish van that comes from Pitt and Ween which is always beautiful, fresh stuff. And they quite often have crabs and lobsters, also scallops. So it might be a good time for us to start taking a bit more interest in where our fish products come from and choosing to buy Scottish products, especially if they're things that we haven't tried before. might be quite nice. I had a look for people living in Clackmannanshire. There's at least two fish fans that come from Pitt and Weem. I know they're in Dollar on a Wednesday. I'm not sure what, what day they're in the rest of Clackmannanshire. But we also have two fishmongers. The one is called the Fresh Fish Place in Alloa at 49 High Street. And they have deliveries daily from, I believe it's Peterhead. And then there's one in Alva as well, which is Alva Fishmongers at 95 Sterling Street. I also noticed that lochfine.com have an online fish delivery section. So, you know, maybe, maybe we could create a bit of a demand ourselves. It's very easy to think, um, oh, well, what can I do on my own? But even if a few of us have a go at maybe choosing Scottish produce, maybe we can create a demand in this country. So if anybody has any thoughts on that or any recommendations, do please get in touch. Let us know.
So what else has 2021 got in store for us? Obviously, we've had just the most incredible weeks viewing from America with Trump securing his legacy, I would say. He's going to go down in history as the president with the biggest tantrum as he was being forced to leave the White House. Just watching that descent into violence and mob rule was quite horrific. And I suppose the thought that flashed through my mind was, this is why we need legitimate independence referendum or some form of democratic event. People get impatient and there's cries for UDI almost daily. But this is why we can't do that. We can't cast ourselves in the moulds of mob rule who are willing to dispense with the law just to get what we want. I mean, that it, that's not the way we need to do it. We need that international recognition, and that comes from doing things legally. But talking about doing things legally, there is a very interesting new podcast which has just started on Indie Live Radio's On Demand. You can get it on the podcast channel and on YouTube, and it's from Jenny Eels' Random Scottish History And you might remember uh, back in episode 35, we had a reading of one of the articles. I think it was 17 something and it was a, a newspaper article at the time about the response to the Treaty of Union. Jenny's just started a series and the very first one is just reading aloud. This is what the treaty actually says. And it's fascinating listening. It's infuriating as well to listen to it but what struck me they spent much much longer talking about salt and who would pay what duty on salt and whether the salt was uh, English salt or Scottish salt or foreign salt and there was almost two lines devoted to our legal system and then they skipped over it and went back to talking about salt so it I don't know if it gives you an idea a a glimpse into the the priorities of the day but it really is a, a fascinating read and I think it's something that might be useful for us all to get more acquainted with because you know how the independence movement loves quoting ancient bits of law well this is the most important of all of them I guess so it's called the, the Treaty of Union Articles and get it on Indie Life Radio's podcast channel. I'll put the link in the, the notes to this podcast. And here's a taster just to whet your appetite. Article 1. That the two kingdoms of Scotland and England shall, upon the first day of May next ensuing the date hereof and forever after, be united into one kingdom by the name of Great Britain, and that the ensigns or memorial of the said United Kingdom be such as Her Majesty shall appoint, and the cross of St Andrew and St George be conjoined in such manner as Her Majesty shall think fit, and used in all flags, banners, standards and ensigns, both at sea and land. Article 18. That the laws concerning regulation of trade, customs and such excises to which Scotland is by virtue of this treaty to be liable, be the same in Scotland, from and after the Union as in England, and that all other laws in use within the Kingdom of Scotland do, after the Union and notwithstanding thereof, remain in the same force as before, except such as are contrary to, or inconsistent with this treaty, but alterable by the Parliament of Great Britain. With this difference betwixt the laws concerning public right, policy, and civil government, and those which concern private right, that the laws which concern public right, policy and civil government may be made the same throughout the whole United Kingdom, but that no alteration be made in laws which concern private right, except for the evident utility of the subjects within Scotland. So I don't know about everybody else, but just listening to the actual wording in the treaty that took our parliament away from us and listening to that section there about our legal system which we think is completely sacrosanct and those words you know subject to the parliament of great britain are in there so i would definitely if you're at all interested in the the history of how we came to be here i would definitely recommend um listening to that podcast and speaking of the integrity of the united kingdom 
there was a very interesting glimpse at Westminster from former Prime Minister Theresa May that finally the penny has dropped. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I refer members to my declaration in the Register of Members' Interests. Uh, My right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, is absolutely right that, of course, trade brings prosperity, it brings jobs. But global Britain is about much, much more than trade. And uh, it is about our shared values, our respect for human dignity, human rights, equality, the rule of law, freedom, democracy. It's about how we work with others who share those values to establish the rules-based and maintain a rules-based international order that protects those uh, values. Uh, And... Sadly, what we saw last week in the United States shows us how fragile the value of democracy can be when it is under pressure from populism and nationalism fuelled by messages disseminated on social media. And at the current point for the United Kingdom, post-Brexit, dealing with Covid, yet to deal with the societal and economic impacts of dealing with Covid, it is absolutely imperative that we reject any push towards nationalism and isolationism and that we recognise the importance of global Britain. Indeed, it is more important today than I think than it ever has been. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, global Britain, if we're going to lead as we can this year in G7 and the COP26, we also need to see a change in world politics, where absolutism, that you're either 100% for me or 100% against me and there's no compromise allowed, uh, has, taken, has taken hold. We need to move away from the world of strong men facing up to each other. We need to find more ways in which we can work with those to share our values because those values are under threat and we need to work together to protect them. Global Britain has that position this year that enables us to do this. But in order to do it, we need to live our values ourselves. And I have to say to the government that threatening to break an international treaty shortly after signing it, that threatening to break international law and that cutting our international aid does not enhance our impact and, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. impact of yeah, global yeah. Britain. In fact, it makes it harder for us yeah, as yeah. global Britain to get our message around the world. Yeah, yeah. We have been respected because of our 0.7%, respected because of what we do, not just because we're British. But in the very few uh, seconds that are available to me, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to, to mention one issue, which is a clear and present danger to global Britain, and that is the breakup of the United Kingdom. And we've talked in this chamber, we often talk about uh, Scotland and about how important uh, uh, being part of the UK is to the Scottish economy. The reality is England needs the rest of the UK as well. The United Kingdom has a seat on the uh, Security Council of the United Nations. I doubt that England would have a seat on the Security Council of the United Nations. We need to think about the impact of this, and I particularly want to mention my concern about Northern Ireland at the moment, because we have seen that issue of those empty supermarket shelves. Not all due to the protocol, but certainly the protocol is playing its part, and the government needs to deal with this issue. Global Britain has a role to play on the world stage, but in order to do that, the government needs to ensure that we maintain the integrity of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. A great pleasure, particularly to uh, follow the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead. And uh, we don't quite agree on the future of the United Kingdom, I have to say, but we will always be on these islands, friends and colleagues, and I hope allies. But it was David Hume that said uh, the truth emerges from an honest disagreement amongst friends. Well, certainly from my side, I'm a friend to all members of the House. But we should be in no doubt this is a very honest disagreement. Global Britain is not my party's project. That'll surprise nobody. I don't wish it any harm, but frankly, I wish it wasn't being inflicted upon my country against our democratic wishes. And I listened carefully, as I always do, to the Secretary of State, uh, as ever, 10 out of 10 for enthusiasm, but 1 out of 10 for detail, and I have to say 0 out of 10 for recognition of the current difficulties in the real world right now. If I was Trade Secretary of the United Kingdom, a a moment of fantasy, and there were shelves empty on a part of the United Kingdom, I would have mentioned that before I would have mentioned global aspirations that are hypothetical at best, rather than the real world consequences. And I'm struck as ever by the ability of the government benches to be giddy with excitement at potential upsides of what global Britain might be. And I do, for the record, wish it well. I I really do want to see global Britain succeed. Uh, The battles of the past are battles for the past. But the hypothetical aspirational advantages are as nothing when set against the real world consequences that people are suffering in the real world right now, today. And 
There is no amount of red, white and blue breathless excitement that will distract from the fact that Global Britain is an answer to a question that nobody in Scotland or Northern Ireland was asking. And frankly, nobody in Northern Ireland or Scotland is interested in right now when we have far more pressing concerns. And the other fact is, regardless of the international links that Global Britain, the UK is going to have, the primary relationship in all forms of trade, human contact, cultural exchange, is always going to be with the continent that we are part of and will remain part of. And despite the deal that was done, such as it was last minute in Brussels at the tail end of the year, far too much of the detail of that relationship remains utterly unclear, causing, again, real problems right now. And the fact that the, the House scrutiny of that agreement and the House scrutiny of those future relationships has been shut down with the committee that should be doing it and is best placed to do it being closed by this administration should really give us all concerns. And the number of things that we're losing, these aren't aspirational hypothetical things. These are things in the real world right now. The loss of the Erasmus exchange is an act of economic vandalism against our universities and higher education sector. It came at the last minute to the talks when previously we'd been told we will keep it, we'll try to keep it, we'll manage to somehow fix it. And at the last minute we were told, no, we weren't. So it's an act of economic vandalism against our universities, but it's an act of vandalism and vindictiveness against the future generations of students who will be shut off from those advantages. I did Erasmus myself in 1992, a long time ago, but the advantages I had then and gained then have stayed with me ever since. And it breaks my heart that future generations will not be able to take advantage of that. And the Turing scheme that has been suddenly created on the back of an envelope to replace it is a pale, pale shadow of those real rights. Presumably it was named after Alan Turing as someone who was treated abominably by the British government. It is an act of vindictiveness against future generations of students and those responsible for that deception should really hang their heads in shame. Scotland, all of our universities want to remain part of the Erasmus programmes. We are, as a Scottish government, trying to find ways to do that. And I really would urge the UK government that if it wants to be global Britain, then it should respect the internal democracy of the United Kingdom and allow Scotland to maintain those international links. There are ways that we could do it, and we're working on that proposal. So where Scotland wants to stay in Erasmus, we also want to help our creative sector. And another thing we're losing, musicians' visas. According to the Musicians Union, 78% of musicians, creatives, have travelled to the EU or EEA over the last year in order to trade, in order to do their business, in order to do that cultural exchange that the soft, soft diplomacy that Global Britain surely relies upon. There was an offer from the EU side to maintain a 90-day visa that would make sure that the EEA was dealt with as a block for all of our creatives travelling abroad. Instead, the UK government rejected it in an act of vindictiveness against our creators because they didn't want internal travel to be coming to us, inward to us. Again, that's something that I really hope can be re reversed because this is a poor decision and it should be changed. And as the real world consequences of loss of freedom of movement, because remember, it, the, the debate in the UK, the debate almost in this house, seems to be predicated on the idea that inward movement happens only in one direction. There are millions of UK nationals enjoying freedom of movement rights across the European Union, which has been a huge boost to us as a society and the soft power that Global Britain surely depends upon. We want those rights back from the Scottish National Party's perspective. But as those rights and the losses of those rights become clear, the people of Scotland are going to have a choice. And as I say, I wish Global Britain well, not with much enthusiasm, I have to say, but I do wish it well. I hope it works. But I'll be putting forward a different proposition to the people of Scotland. Independence in Europe. There was nothing in EU membership that was holding the UK back from what it wants to do. And I very much uh, echo the concerns from the member uh, for Islington South and Finsbury mentioned about lack of ambition on human rights, climate change, environmental standards, all the things that we think the UK government is engaged in a race to the bottom for rather than maintaining high EU standards. But we're going to be putting forward the independence in Europe, which will regain the rights for our exporters, for our universities, for our students, for our people who will regain the rights of freedom of movement, a huge societal and economic boost. And unlike in 2014, the first independence referendum, 
these are real world rights that have just been taken away from us and the consequences are clear. And we'll be able to set them against the aspirational advantages of global Britain. And I look forward to that discussion. And I look forward to holding this government to account for its promises. I wish them well in fulfilling them, but I am confident that they will make nothing compared to the losses that we have all suffered by leaving the European Union in the worst way possible. And the lack of clarity that emerges from the continuing talks that will need to be maintained in order to take the future relationship with the European Union forward. Because wherever global Britain becomes, geography will not be altered. Britain is a medium ranking state within the European continent. Scotland's comfortable with that and independence in Europe is our political answer to the best aspirations of the people of Scotland. I think it's the best aspiration and the best answer to global Britain as well. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Sterling MEP Alan Smith there giving Theresa uh, Scotland's response to her pleas for UK integrity and no doubt emboldened by the fact we've just had the 18th poll in a row showing support for Scottish independence is in the majority and 57% for yes in the most recent one. <laughs> So leaving the failing politics of Westminster behind, let's turn to Scottish politics, where unbelievably the Labour Party's Scottish branch office is going to inflict another divisive leadership contest in the middle of a pandemic. What are they thinking of? Now, like everybody else, I I welcome the return of the annual Labour leadership contest. And I look forward to seeing which likely lad or lass is going to be given the poison chalice this year. Yet again, make the point that if Scottish Labour want to have a future in an independent Scotland, it might be an idea to get on board now and start helping to shape that future, rather than standing on the sidelines and complaining about it on behalf of the country next door. And by contrast, playing a genuine part in shaping the future of the country we want to become, the Scottish Citizens' Assembly has produced their final report. Now, I think that what they've come up with is astonishingly impressive and particularly encouraging that the composition of the Assembly was picked to reflect the political balance that existed in Scotland at the time it was set up, which I think was probably before the opinion polls started coming in, showing that yes had a majority. Um, So anyway, they've done uh, on their website, citizensassembly.scot. You can find all the materials relating to all the workshops, all the work they've done, um, all the input sessions, and also, most importantly, their recommendations. The full report and all 60 recommendations is on their website, citizensassembly.scot. But in the meantime, they've produced a little video, which I think gives a flavour of what they came up with and just what the experience was like for them being part of the first ever Citizens' Assembly in Scotland. Over 100 people from right across Scotland have gathered as the country's first ever Citizens' Assembly. I stay in Bears Den, just outside Glasgow, and my job is an IT manager. I'm Maxine, I'm staying in Inverness, I've got two sons, um, I work as an admin in a community centre, but I'm furloughed just now. My name's David, I'm originally from Poland. I'm Evelyn, I'm from Shorts in North Lanarkshire. I'm 28 years old, my name is Melissa and I am a primary school teacher. I work part time because I have a little boy who is three. I'm a manager in a textile company. I'm a nurse. I'm a teacher here in Livingston. I'm currently studying reproductive biology. I have worked in care for 40 odd years. We were given a huge job to set out a roadmap for our future, a vision for the country we want to build and how to tackle our biggest challenges. It's a huge honour to be part of something that is going to shape 
the future of the country you live in. I'm not being it for a long number of years, but I have got children and grandchildren who are going to, I hope, grow up in this country. And I want to make sure it's a, if I can contribute anything, I contribute towards making it a good place for them to grow up. It was up to us to open the door for a new way of doing democracy in Scotland. And to keep the door wide open, not just ajar. We formed a mini Scotland, broadly representative of the diversity that exists here. Across age, gender, class, ethnicity, education, different regions and political attitudes. We met as strangers, but we have made friends and agreed the common ground amongst us. It's a good thing to be listened to. It's a good thing to contribute to whatever society you find yourself. Consensus takes work. We found it by building on the values we share. We listened. We shared so much from our own lives and all our different everyday experiences. We learned together and that evidence formed the bedrock for our vision for the country and recommendations for how we get there. I have chosen Scotland as my home so I feel privileged. I can contribute to build it in a different way than I was doing so far so it, it feels immensely important. Covid came as you were right in the thick of it and held us back for a few months. It has brought more big questions and sharpened some we already have in our sights. We moved online and shared what we know of these, the hardest days many of us have ever faced. The, the whole kind of lay of the land has changed since we last met and we've got this huge obstacle in the road that, that I think in a way has kind of bring forward a lot of the things that we'd already been discussing about. We want Scotland to be brilliant, we want to be there for everybody and with that kind of... I always felt that there would have to be some kind of huge material change for, for that to kind of come to fruition. I think we've got it now because it's, it's now clear that we need kind of systemic changes in healthcare and our kind of social policy and um, employment and kind of protection of the vulnerable and all that. So I, I've seen it like first hand for the pandemic, like people, people are living different lives. We stuck at it because we want to do our bit to get all of us through this, together. Our vision is for a country that's confident and innovative. A country that supports our most vulnerable. A country built around the needs of the people who live here. A country where government and citizens build a mutual respect together. A country that is out to make the most of our potential and starts by leaving nobody behind. It can sometimes feel like we can't agree on anything anymore, but we've done the work, we've talked it through, and we agree on this. Our 60 recommendations set out the actions to make this vision a reality. Here are some of the key points. We, the Citizens Assembly of Scotland, recommend that citizens are more involved from now on through more active democratic participation, nationally and in our communities and at our Scottish Parliament. We recommend the living rate should be a legal requirement. We recommend a concerted effort to eliminate poverty. We recommend the abolition of zero hour contracts. Up to about, well, I say five years ago, there was very little discussions about food banks. Now, um, um, they were get, although they were getting worse up to the pandemic, um, they just seem to be the main source for people's lifelines, which has highlighted the, the how, how much poverty this country is actually in, or how many of the people are actually in poverty and employed. You know, I think that's a big thing that seems to be skipped in a bit, that a lot of people have an income, have a social income, have a, they, they work in fronting work, they, um, they work in um, the leisure industries, uh, they work in pubs, yet they still have to finance themselves with um, charitable support. If you go back 20 years ago, that would never ever have been the case. So how on earth would we let society get to that? We recommend using the tax system to meet our vision of an innovative and sustainable country and for our revenue and public spending to be communicated to citizens in a way that the public can understand. I think it is uh, of paramount importance that, uh, that there were uh, so many recommendations focused on ensuring the, um, the basic support to the the fo focusing on the job, uh, focusing on creating opportunities for the uh, for the young people, so that uh, the the jobs will be created, uh, will be done, and I very much hope that that will be implemented. 
We recommend different ways of supporting young people, from greater mental health support to rent caps to improve training and education initiatives. We recommend building a sustainable country through public education on the environmental crisis and what all of us can do about it, maximising our renewable energy potential and incentivising sustainable behaviour across the board. We recommend a pay rise for NHS staff and have agreed other ideas to make sure we value and improve our public healthcare system. We recommend that further tax powers be devolved. We recommend that Scotland manage its own immigration laws. We recommend that internet access should be considered a basic need free to all. It's one of the things that will go down in history, not only being part of the Assembly, being part of the first ever Citizens' Assembly of Scotland. I want to be part of Scotland's future. I'm quite passionate about Scotland thriving as a, as a country and to be part of something that you're representing the people representing myself. I want my daughter to look back and say, oh, that's my mum's face there. You know, she's part of that, that lineup of people that were involved in that. I think it's, it's, it makes you feel so proud. All 60 of the recommendations were supported by a big majority of members. We hope you'll hear us, the voices of the people of Scotland. We hope you'll act upon what we've agreed through our hard work and open minds. We have done ourselves proud and the nation proud. I'm absolutely certain about that. I hope it can make a very big difference and I hope we can trust that we're being listened to. Let this help point the way on the journey we are taking towards a better country. And so from the Citizens' Assembly to the Clax Wifey Assembly, our virtual coffee shop, and a variety of topics being chewed over today. Did you see the wee poem that Guy's written in the form of the Conservatives' lunch menu? The Conservative Party headquarters' lunchtime menu. Starters, deprived shrimps, money-glazed smirked ham, born fritters, battered electorate with a basket of crushed hopes, half-baked baked notions idling on a soft bed of privilege served with a thick faux pas sauce. Kids in blankets, deep famished with a deprivation of vegetables and relish reduction. Codes in the hole with golden hands out in a thick, rich gravy. Open brackets, self-serving only. Brackets. <laughs> and then pudding is eaten mess, fudge, ten different flavours. <laughs> it's like all of our twists. What is the situation in Scotland though? Because is it vouchers that our kids get through the... It depends on the council. Some girls, some get just get the money. It allows the parents to buy what they know their kids like in a way. I discovered that first six months of last year, two and a half thousand children in England, note that this was in England, presented at hospitals with malnutrition. Yeah. Oh. Now, I looked up the figures for Scotland trying to get a breakdown for those. And interestingly enough, if somebody has malnutrition in Scotland, they're more likely to be over 65. That's interesting. Just a, well, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I was watching that absolutely excellent EU movement Zoom oh, call. Oh, that was very good. Wasn't it good? I so recommend you go and listen to it. Yeah. I've put the link on the Wifey Facebook page, but I've also put it into the EU playlist on the Indie Life Radio YouTube if you want to watch it. The EU movement one was very interesting, and particularly regarding the euro. Their comments at the end of it were very much, you will have to accept the euro. Don't think Europe is going to do what they did with the the rest of the UK by accepting you having your own currency and uh, doing whatever you wish. You will definitely have to comply. There was a bit about timing though. The thing I wondered having listened to that, I mean it was really noticeable because they, they picked up that people were putting comments that were quite negative about the euro in the chat function obviously mm. and a few of them picked up went now hold on you're wanting the EU to look at your whole case for coming back in. And if the narrative on the euro is that negative, that counts against you. And it doesn't mean that when we join, we have to instantly join the euro. I mean, look at Sweden still hasn't, you know, half of them still yeah, haven't. Yeah, absolutely, but, absolutely. But the narrative has to be, yes, we're open to it. We're thinking 
about it. We're thinking about it. We're not we're not anti it at all. We're just thinking. And given that we have to have our own currency before we can join, the idea that you would go to all the bother of setting up your own currency and then instantly switch to the euro, I I don't think would be expected. But it just made me wonder whether it would be interesting to get the people who are, you know, your, your Tim Ride out and the, the, mod, the currency group and all the ones who are really on about here's the potential when you've got your own currency, here's what you can do and let them see what the EU is saying because there's a clash of narratives there that we're going to have to resolve. So if you go with the euro, does that mean we're not kind of sovereign with regards to currency? We can't decide how much currency we issue within our country. Does that have to come from Brussels or whatever? Yeah, because that is that not what happened with Greece? You know, the reason they got into such trouble was they didn't have control over their own currency. It's like if Yorkshire went bankrupt and the rest of the, the UK using sterling are saying, no, we're not letting you change the exchange rate in Yorkshire in order to resolve your currency issue. You're part of the whole. And I think that multiplied up is kind of what the Eurozone is. Yes, go on. I'm probably getting this completely wrong. <laughs> well, well, no, I, I'm going to interject with, don't be too kind about Greece. Greece lied about what its finance situation was. There's a big part of me that was pro-EU which now feels very strongly about EFTA, frankly. And I think it would be interesting to, to look more at that. Yeah. The EU does not have a sustainable policy regarding fishing, whereas if you look at both Norway and Iceland, they do. Mm. Both of them are very much in control of what they are doing. And I'm not saying that fishing is the most important aspect, but at the moment, we would be the biggest supplier of oil in the whole of the mm. EU. As a result, I think you would probably find that financially, we would be in a slightly different situation mm. than we are at present. I was at an interesting talk last night, which was, there was a chat called Dave McCann who made comments about he would not encourage, and he's part of the New Economics Foundation. Tim Rideout was there and there was Roger Mullen. Of the three speakers, to be honest, he was the most interesting. So this new economic foundation, he was very critical of the euro. It's going to be really interesting. I mean, I think by default, we're going to end up having to go into EFTA first anyway, just because of the time it's going to take us to get back into the EU. Once we're back in EFTA, whether that takes away the drive to become full EU members, we'll have to wait and see. It is going to be interesting, but it just struck me the euro, I've been quite who cares about it up until Tim Rideout and the modern monetary folks started talking about oh, but here's what you can do with your own currency and Richard Murphy and all those. And you start looking at that, you're thinking, oh, that's tempting. So I don't yeah. know. Well, I think we'll have yeah. to see how this one plays out. But I, I just have made a mental note to not be critical of the idea of joining the euro because if that's something that could then be held against us then why would we take a position right now when who knows what the situation's going to be in five years time i mean how often do people actually use that to be part of that be honest i miss it enormously it's it's actual physical control i think as soon as you're using a card, you forget about some of the expenditure that you've had. You're not necessarily, at the present moment, you're probably not even picking up a receipt as mm. proof of your purchase to, in order to remind yourself. So you now have bank statements coming in with loads of two pounds here, one pound here. I mean, ludicrous, ludicrous. There's a huge part of the cash economy which we forget about. You know, there's the, there's the man on the street who's looking for just some food because universal credit system doesn't work properly. If people don't have cash, they can't give them any cash. The babysitter that came round, the tip for the taxi driver. There are a whole range of things which, although they're referred to as the black economy, are actually quite essential. Yeah, no, no, it's almost like it's a control thing. If you don't have cash, if everything's on card, it's like Big Brother, the state knows everything about you almost, isn't it? Worse, it's the handmaid's tale. They can decide yeah. that women get no, no bank accounts. <laughs> it is, it's like if you want to give somebody 20 quid or whatever, you know, people doing charity collections or backpacks in supermarkets and things like that. Then there's the convenience side 
And again, I suppose it depends on where you are in your financial life. So this morning I was in Tesco's. You just hold your card up at the machine and that's it. It's so easy for people to get really in a spiral of debt because you just click this card on things and credit can be extended and clawed back at astronomical rates. There's a whole kind of wormhole you could go down. You will reduce the number of people working in banks. You will reduce the service sector. And actually, the whole point of going into a shop, a bank, etc., is to have a communication with another individual. You remove that cash element. You remove quite a number of jobs as well. I just kind of think money at the moment. I just look at it as infection counters. It's just little bits of hard surfaces that people are touching. I remember once getting a a taxi somewhere and I was getting the money to pay the taxi driver. And I pulled money out of my purse and I sucked the fiver in my mouth while I was paying the coins out. And the taxi driver whipped the fiver out of my mouth and he went, don't ever do that. You don't know what germs are on these notes. Mm. And I was like, mm. well, I've got paper cut the second of my mouth. <laughs> Just let the germs into your system properly, dear. Yes, but I mean, now, when we think about it, COVID is so easily transferred by paper money. Equally, saying that I took Star for a walk the other morning, I did quite well. I found 22p on the way round. But I picked it up, <laughs> got indoors, and straightway had to go and wash my hands and the money, you know, because you don't know what, what's been touching, no, you know. you just don't. What are we thinking about um, poor old Tricky Dicky standing down? What about me? I ranted about him the day before because he saw me outside at First Minister's questions. I sent him an email in the evening. I was only wanting an apology. And <laughs> <laughs> you really didn't need to quit. I was basically saying you should really watch what you say because he went on about the First Minister and the SNP look like they're working with what I'm tied behind their back. Well, I didn't take offence at much, right? I really, really didn't. Maybe a joke than anything, but I thought, no. There's absolutely nothing wrong with anybody wanting me just one of them. <laughs> Quite <laughs> right. Do you think they've been pushed from south of the border? Mm. Yeah, definitely. Reinforces the fact they're just a branch office, doesn't it? Yeah, they'll need to get some place before the elections and then get them going and what have you. You found stuff online yesterday and basically the guy saying that some millionaire donor mm. was basically held them to ransom saying, well, if you don't get rid of Richard Leonard, then I'm not donating to you so basically from down south from the exec down there they've basically said well richard leonard has to go because we need this money and this donor's not going to give it unless richard leonard goes and there was something as well about that starmer was reportedly furious because (coughs) scottish labor voted along with the scottish government about the brexit bill at christmas and then of course he took the opposite line at Westminster. But again, that just shows you they're just a branch office. Are they also not likely to lose money from the various unions as well? But then the unions are actually pro indie Yeah, possibly. It's going to be really interesting, I think, to see what Scottish Labour does now, because in the same way as there's a Conservative and a Unionist party within the Scottish Conservatives, is there going to be the same within Labour? And if 40%, I read in the National Today, 35 40% of Labour members are saying they're going to vote SNP in May. Mm. So there's Mm. just nothing left of the party. I just don't understand why they can't go. We think there's a need for a left socialist party. Therefore, we're going to get on board with independence. That's the way the world's going. It's inevitable. And we'll start shaping a new country. That's the only way they've got a future. like being in bed with the Tory party, though. Well, yeah. yeah. I have to laugh at Michelle Ballantyne, though. That's that's one of the most hilarious ones. Oh, isn't it? Can't imagine that she's going to do anything other than take votes from the Tories. But equally, yeah, probably will lose her deposit as well. That'd be so sweet, though. I know. So sweet. Yeah. And they're not saying Katie Hopkins has joined Farage's party, <laughs> Labour's oh, party, whatever it is. Like, just keep all the nutters in the one place. Mm. Yeah. It's coming to something that when the most far right conservative government that we've ever had is not far right enough for you. <laughs> that really yeah, does yeah. tell you something. There are silent Tory voters here who have to be careful of being critical of the Tory party because in many respects they're voting Tory without, like a lot of old Labour did, went into the booth to vote without actually 
totally being aware of what's going on. We again need to get our message out is exactly what or what we can't do within the Scottish Government at the present moment. Yeah, yeah, but again it's like they're going in not really knowing what they're doing because they're only believing what they're fed in the mainstream media and the mainstream mm-hmm. media yeah, is controlled yeah. by the right so it just perpetuates, doesn't it? Yeah. And then and then when when something goes wrong, they blame it on to blame the, the problems with the with the fishing industry up in the northeast. Well, it's that's the yeah, the Scottish government's fault. How do they figure that out? Mm. But they say it and they say it again, and and people mm-hmm. will then believe it because they keep okay. saying mm. it's the Scottish government's fault. I mean, I, I saw one interview, and at least it was Martin Geisler who kind of said to what was the guy's name? Do good. Mm. But no, but we, but you gave them six days with regards to changes in paperwork. And your minister for fisheries didn't read the document because she was too busy sorting her village nativity trail. I mean, no, she I mean, she actually, she said that. And you think people should be going, I'm sorry. You're paid 80 grand a year as an MP, probably mm. more depending on if you're in a ministerial, whatever sort of ministerial role you're in. So do your job, know your village's nativity trail. You shouldn't have been doing a nativity trail anyway. So that's it for this episode. Plenty going on wherever you look and it's still only the middle of January. Next on the agenda for the Clax Wifeys will be our Burns Night Poetry Podcast. And if we get time, we might try doing some Yes Stones with Burns themes. We were thinking that um, No Timorous Beasties Here might be a good motif. So we'll see what we come up with. If anybody would like to get in touch with us, you can get us on our Clax Women for Indie Facebook page or you can always email me at fiona at indielive.radio and if anybody would like to be part of the podcast you're very welcome and equally if other Women for Indie groups would like to have a go at doing their own podcast and they'd like a bit of a hand to get started then we'd be very happy to help. So I hope that chased away the January blues and thanks for listening everybody and we'll catch you next time. Bye now.